All right. So let's go ahead and get started if that works. And we'll just, you'll keep monitoring that, Rebecca? Yep. Fantastic. So thank you all for joining us today in our first meeting of the reopening task force in the Ferndale School District. We really appreciate you being here with us. Um, my name is Kelly Larrabee and I am the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning here in Ferndale. And I will apologize ahead of time that my audio is typically terrible. Um, and a lot of you could probably attest to that. And so if I'm cutting in and out, please let me know. I've tried to use something else today avoid that, but I apologize in advance if it happens. You will then see Faye and I running from office to office sharing um, computer and audio. So we'll have a default backup plan should that be the case. But um, thank you for being here. And um, we are just going to spend about two hours probably tonight, maybe not all that um, time, but we are going to spend some time together. And I'm hoping right now you see the reopening school task force presentation. You can Faye, can you give me a thumbs up? Only see you on my screen. Fantastic. So we are going to be um, working as a group for the next several weeks. And so the purpose of this task force is to re, um, research, discuss, and develop um, reopening recommendations that we will ultimately um, share with our executive team as well as our school board. And I just want to be really clear um, that the structure of this group may at times be all together like we are tonight. And there may be times where we are breaking out into subgroups based on specific areas such as transportation or technology. Um, but we've attempted to identify some of those subgroups. So we will meet together sometimes and sometimes we will be doing more specific um, work with a subgroup of individuals. So our goal in our time today is really to set the foundation um, for our work. So today will not be very collaborative in nature. There will be time for some conversation. So I want to apologize in advance that it's going to be a lot of us sharing information and guidance and data. And um, so if you do have a question or a thought or a wondering, we would highly encourage you to use the chat today um, to record that. And we'll do our best to respond to those um, comments as well. So um, once again, I apologize. And there may be a chance that we may mute you if there's a lot of background um, noise. So just as we're, we'll do our best to get through this. But in the future, we will hope to have it be more collaborative in nature. But today is more of just laying the foundation um, for us moving forward. So that is just really something I wanted to share with you. And this task force, um, we have a timeline that we have in place. Today is the seventh, it's our first meeting. We are hoping to meet every Tuesday between now and August 18th. And that 18th is a critical date because we have to have our plan to OSPI, which is the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction here in the state of Washington. We have to have our plan approved by the board on the 18th, and we have to send it to OSPI by the 19th. So two weeks before the beginning of the year, we have to have our plan into OSPI. So this timeline that you see on your screen is really kind of that backwards design. We started with September 2nd being the first day of school, you know, backing the two weeks to August 19th. So that's when it has to be submitted to OSPI. And then we have the August 18th um, school board meeting where hopefully it'll be approved at that time. And then the corresponding Tuesday dates um, between now and then. Um, we also are hoping to add some corresponding um, town hall types of meetings to get some more community feedback as we continue on in this work, um, as well as additional um, possible board meeting um, sessions. And so, at, for instance, there's one next week where, well where we will be giving a brief update um, based on this first meeting. So we have a timeline in place that is pretty tight, but we're optimistic that we have a wonderful group of people that we've that have come together to do the work. So we really appreciate um, your willingness to participate on this um, task force. We had over 80 applicants 
um, that submitted interest in this task force, and that was outstanding. So as you can see, this is just a quick visual of the different um, representatives that we do have participating on the task force. And we have quite a few individuals. We have somebody from the Department of Health. Um, so thank you, Zach, for joining us. We have somebody from our child care um, representative from YMCA. So Shannon's with us. We have some um, health practitioners, just a lot of um, technology experts. We really, really worked hard to identify individuals from a variety of areas and expertise that represents um, all of our schools, as well as different um, programs that operate within our schools. So we were really mindful and intentional to try to select this committee. And we ended up selecting more people than we had intended, but um, we feel like it's a great group that can do the work. So I will be one of your facilitators. And once again, I'm the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. I've been a principal in the district um, at both Custer and Cascadia as well. So this is my, I'm finishing my first year in this role. Um, Faye Britt will also be um, facilitating. So Faye, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, thanks again. Um, as Kelly said, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate your willingness to um, and help contribute to um, our reopening efforts here. Um, so as I said, I'm Faye. I was formerly at Horizon and this walking into my first year as Executive Director of Teaching and Learning um, alongside Kelly. So um, our one of our big tasks this summer is to facilitate this and hope to um, with the intent of having our schools reopen safely in the fall. Thanks, Faye. Our next facilitator that will be um, assisting us with this process is Rebecca Champagne. And Rebecca has been the one that's been giving us the status updates on everybody coming in. So Rebecca, can you introduce yourself? Yes, um, I am Rebecca Champagne. I am the Director of Special Education in the Ferndale School District. And at the moment, I am just managing our users, making and helping people that are emailing and calling to get in so that they can participate in this work today. And um, I'm looking forward to being part of this team and helping people out. Thanks, Rebecca. So this team, we have um, approximately 56 individuals. Um, two of those being the community partners I mentioned previously. We have some students. We have 12 parents and guardians. We have two school board members, five district level, excuse me, 11 district level administrators, um, building administrators, we have five, um, certificated staff, we have 13. And when I say certificated, that's usually um, teachers within our district. We also have classified staff as well. Um, so that would be an example like a paraeducator. So while we would really like to introduce everyone today that's attending, we also tried to calculate the minutes approximately that it would take for everyone to do that. And we think that that might be a little bit too long in the press time that we have together. So what we would like you to do and what we would ask that you please do is sometime during the meeting today, it doesn't have to be right this moment, if you could please in the chat, um, uh, write down your name or chat your name, um, your role. Are you representing as a staff member, a parent, a community member? And then what is your specific area of expertise and interest? And we'll use that in a variety of ways um, moving forward. But it also helps us get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so once again, anytime throughout the meeting, if you could please type that in the chat. Once again, your name, your role, and your area of expertise or interest. And I'm already seeing chat come in, so thank you. Okay, so I would like to just give you a quick overview of today's work. Um, we're, we'll be doing our introductions. We'll be talking about norms. And while in the perfect world, we would have time to set norms collaboratively with uh, uh, this crunch timeline, we have some predetermined norms that we actually emailed as well yesterday in our introduction email that we just wanted to discuss because as we are moving forward with this work, there are some really important topics that are going to come up and some of them are going to challenge us in our own thinking as well. So just making sure that we are operating on a consistent set of norms will be important um, for this team. We will also talk today about the OSPI guidance. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the themes from Chris Reichdahl, and that was really important from that 12-minute video um, that we sent and included in the correspondence we sent yesterday as well. We'll spend time talking about the community and staff survey results. We will talk about um, scheduling next steps. We'll also talk a little bit about the themes that emerged from the thought exchange that we asked you to um, participate in yesterday. And then we'll just talk about overall next steps from here. So we have quite a bit on the agenda today, but um, once again, we thank you for listening to us because it will be a lot of that today, but we are really appreciative of your willingness to partner with us. And we are really excited about um, your voice and what you represent within our community and having that perception is really important to us. So thank you in advance for your um, participation and your voice. So next I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca who's going to talk a little bit more about our norms. All right, thank you. I'm gonna let a couple people in that just popped into the waiting room. So um, when we're looking at our norms, one of the things as we work through this um, reopening task force is we're going to ask everybody to stay engaged. That requires us to be present for yourself and others and having, you know, your perspective and the perspective of maybe others that you represent, your student, you know, your own children, your students, um, others in the community, and always um, presume that we are all here to participate to support our students. So extend that welcome and be welcoming and bring your whole self to the work, which is that you're fully present and ready to um, participate because that's where we're gonna get the value out of this particular group because we represent such a wide variety of perspectives in our community and schools. Um, that our focus is gonna be on the children. So we're gonna remember our kids um, that, that we need, um, they need us to be positive. They need us to be creative and energetic on their behalf. Um, we have lots of little people um, that we're working on putting a program together for in the fall that don't necessarily have access to um, a community level voice because they're, they're shy or they're young or they don't have a way to communicate um, what their needs and, and concerns are. So let's keep it focused on our kids. Um, speak for yourself. And what does, what does that really mean? Um, it says use I statements. So instead of saying, I think the entire community believes this, um, say my perspective is, or I feel like this is something we need to consider. So making sure that we're, um, we're not trying to um, over-represent um, a perspective unless we are able to back that up with um, evidence or information, like some of the information we're gonna share today directly from OSPI, for example. Um, make space for silence and reflection. Sometimes it's, there's a lot of information that's gonna be coming at us. Um, and so it's gonna be important that we kind of slow down and think about it and listen. Um, and sometimes we might hear some perspectives that are different from our own. And how do we make space for that and, and listen and understand? Um, create a, a learning space enriched by differences. That feeds into that, make space to hear other perspectives and, and learn from each other. Um, keep an open mind. And make sure that we're hearing each other's truths, because again, we each have our own perspectives based on um, our experiences in our homes or our neighborhoods or what our role is in this team. Um, when things get tough, turn to wonder and curiosity. So if you're in a challenging situation or you're in a, in a tough spot, um, ask, ask questions. Um, try to see it through others' eyes or other perspectives and be curious. We're gonna try to um, turn away from judgment, but um, really be compassionate in our inquiry and question so that we better understand. All right, um, no unsolicited fixing. And what does that really mean? Um, we're seeking through deep listening and through open questioning and gathering of ideas to gather our own um, clarity and to help put shine light on the work that we need to do as we move forward. So we're gonna be generating ideas as we break, get into our breakout groups as the, as the weeks go on, but um, we're gonna be looking to have a collective understanding of what our, our vision and mission is going to be moving forward in the reopening work. And this is long-term work. We won't have solutions tonight or next week. 
Um, and our goal is that we will have a really strong um, recommendation for our school board and our executive team um, by the by August and maybe even earlier. But we also know that, that some of that work might be ongoing as as the system and the situation changes. And the last thing that we're going to ask is that we observe confidentiality. There's going to be a lot of work that goes on in here. Um, people are going to be vulnerable, sharing their ideas and their thoughts and their concerns. And we want to make sure that this is a safe place to do that. <coughs> All right. Faye. Faye is going to guide us through our OSPI guidance. That's the next step we're going to talk about. I'll unmute. <laughs> um, so as, as you'll have noticed in the email we spent at, sent out last night, we included the OSPI guidance in that um, link to the rather lengthy um, document. Um, that guidance includes um, information about how we are expected to safely reopen our schools. Um, a large part of the guidance comes from um, the Department of Health and Labor and Industries um, and our requirements, um, both kind of safety requirements and, um, I just, could you pop back to the slide, Kelly? Thanks. <laughs> um, and as well as those scheduling concepts that we might need to consider in order to um, ensure that we adhere to those health and safety and labor of industry guidance. Um, so one of the first parts about that comes from the health and safety rules out of the um, Department of Health, Labor and Industries, which is also known as L&I. Um, and they include expectations around our health screening of staff and students, um, checking for symptoms, um, making sure that people are healthy when they come to school, um, includes physical distancing guidance, um, how we um, manage meal times at school, um, hygiene, hand washing, you've probably heard everyone talking about hand washing and hand sanitizer and um, cleanliness, um, cloth face coverings, which are a requirement um, transportation expectations and then protocols for cleaning, um, both deep cleaning and kind of daily cleaning and how we, um, especially um, with materials between, um, that would usually be shared amongst students and requirements around that as well. The next part of the statutory requirements include, as Kelly explained at the beginning, us sharing our reopening plan with OSPI um, after we have sought and gained school board approval on our plan. And the plan needs to be flexible enough that we have a plan for reopening, but also that can allow us to switch to um, full-time continuous learning, which they're calling um, continuous learning 2.0 should the need arise where we have to close schools so that we can instantly switch um, in that and be flexible in that change. Um, the requirements will include our instructional days and hours, which is currently 1,027 hours and 180 school days. And it includes requirements around our attendance and our enrollment and how we, which is how we receive funding um, for our schools. Um, it also includes directions for how we assess students when they return to school and how we monitor progress as well as um, identifying and narrowing our essential learning standards for our students and then our grading practices. So those are kind of the constraints that we are again bound by. And then some then the guidance also gives us actions for implementation. Um, we have multiple groups kind of working on some of the different logistical pieces of this. Um, <laughs> but as you can see here, we're looking at um, professional development, making sure our students get feedback, making sure our staff and students are trained um, on the safety requirements. Um, one of the key pieces here is supporting in transitions, and that's for our students who are moving on from one building to the next or coming in as kindergarten and first grade for the first time. And they're going to need some specific and intentional targeted support to allow them to transition to a building and start what they're familiar with. 
Um, the diagnostic screeners look at both academics and social emotional needs. And um, we engaging our community partners and communicating out um, frequently. As you know, we're recording this meeting so that we can share this and along with the minutes. Um, making sure that we have family and student voice and that we also think about the supports we're gonna to need to put in place to support students um, in the classroom and with their behavior when they return to in-person learning. Uh, the OSPI guidance gives us three, really three different options, although one is not necessarily an option, but a part that we um, turn to when we're consider considering our scheduling concepts that allow us to maintain um, some of those health requirements, like particularly the um, social, social distancing expectation. So we, um, as you know, surveyed our community and our staff um, to look at which of these options kind of um, maybe made sense to them or were prefer what they were comfortable with, not comfortable with. So we have the flexibility to split or rotate our schedules, which means that different groups of students come in at different times. Um, and we have the ability to have phased in where we bring either grade levels in or students furthest from um, what we consider students furthest away from educational justice um, or that we you know, phase in by grade band, lots of different options within that. And then the last option is the continuous learning, which I just mentioned a little bit ago, where that allows us to fully function should the need arise for us to close a school or the district. And then the other thing that we shared out um, was the video to um, Chris Reichdor, who's the state superintendent of um, public instruction. He, after his press conference on June 11, he came back a few days later and gave a little bit more clarity to both the guidance and to the expectations for reopening in the fall. Um, and really clearly shared that traditional in-person school is very unlikely due to those um, Department of Health and labor and industry requirements. And bottom line is safety for our students, safety for our staff, safety for our families is the paramount paramount importance. He talked again about face coverings being negotiable, um, six foot rule for planning, um, looking at encouraging alternative transportation, um, but also shared how buses are you know, a short term duration. They're not sitting on a bus for six hours. Um, and that should families not feel comfortable at returning to school, then we are really tasked as a district with making sure that we accommodate that and have options to do both online and blended learning. And on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Kelly to share a little bit more with you about what we learned from our staff and our communities. Thanks, May. I just may have accidentally hit a button. Does it say reopening planning um, results right now? Fantastic, all right. I wasn't uh, intending to make that smooth transition or to cut you off there, Faye, so I apologize. I was just getting it ready. Perfect. All right. So um, we shared uh, this information last week with the school board. And what I'd like to say is it's already been updated again as of the 5th of July, um, because we continue to get um, survey results in. So as of today, uh, actually, yes, Okay. We have 1,607 um, family responses, and that's approximately 36% of our student population. So while we would still love it to be more representative of our student population, um, it's also significantly higher than most surveys that we um, receive or have participation with. So we are happy that we do have that information from families. And once again, each family was asked, please fill this out um, for every child within their family. Um, we also have received 486 staff responses, which is a little bit over 70%. What was really interesting as we have um, attempted to analyze this um, data is how consistent those, um, both those surveys were in the results based on family and staff. So I'll share some of that information with you today. So um, high-speed internet continues to be an area of significant concerns um, for many of our families. 
Um, and so when you see right here, 86% um, of our staff have high speed internet, 6% um, do not. Families, 84% um, have high speed internet and 10% do not. Um, and some of the limitations that um, were identified, um, those are areas aren't serviced, which is about 39% of that number, um, and then 12%, um, um, which was 39 individuals indicated that cost was an issue for accessing the internet. Um, and there were there was a handful of people that just aren't interested. And then there was a, another um, group here of, called of other, and really that group represents initially when we um, shared the survey, people filled it out very quickly. And one of the questions was incorrect answered, so it required a response there. So when somebody entered other, they responded with, yes, I already said I have internet. Um, so we quickly changed it, but there are quite a few responses that were recorded there. Um, one of the, we waited very intentionally before we published this survey because we were waiting on OSPI guidance. We really wanted to find out what exactly it was going to say and then ask our community and our family what their thoughts were. So the three um, health and safety areas that Faye mentioned earlier um, regarding are, are regarding face coverings, um, symptom checks or health checks, and physical distancing requirements. So um, what we did was not comfortable, comfortable with concerns, and comfortable with little to no concerns. So as you can see, face coverings um, was the area of greatest concern for um, both students and um, staff. And so it's been interesting though, because as we continue to receive responses within the last week, a week and a half, all of a sudden those numbers and percentages are changing. So as we are continuing to update that, it's not necessarily the same as the state or as we've been mandated to wear masks now. So it's been interesting to watch that change over time. Um, symptom checks seem to be something people are comfortable with concerns or comfortable with little to no concerns with, for the most part. And physical distancing requirements. Um, oh, I'm sorry there. Um, there was some area of concern still about how we were going to do that. Um, so this was the feedback we received regarding the health and safety concerns. And the next piece of information I'm going to share is regarding those three scheduling concepts Faye mentioned. The first one being a split or rotating schedule. So with a split or rotating schedule, there's really three different options within that. The first is that you would basically rotate every other day. So if you have a student, they may come on Monday and Wednesday and Tuesday and Thursday, but it's basically there's alternating days where your students would attend um, classes. And um, this was fairly comparable with the two days on or two days off, but definitely um, this option right here, the every other day, and then the two days on or the two days off. So that would mean, for instance, my child may come on Monday and Tuesday that week. So they have two consecutive days with that model. Um, so those two were definitely the more preferred options within the split or rotating schedule um, compared to the alternating weeks. Um, the alternating week option was clearly not the favorable option for either staff or family. So the alternating weeks is basically one week off and then one week off one week on, one week off. So this um, was not the preferred option, but when you add up here for the comfortable with concerns and comfortable with little to no concerns, um, both staff and families um, preferred the um, two days on, two days off, but it was very comparable with every other alternating day schedule as well. But the two days on, two days off, that was the most favorable option within the split or rotating schedule. the phased in schedule that was the other option that Faye talked about so this is when we may have some students in our building full time and so we have to be very mindful of how and we do that and who is it that's coming in so once again there were several examples provided um, from the ospi guidance and that's why we specifically asked these questions because it was taken directly from that guidance so um, the first one was where we start with maybe a certain grade so or span so for instance we're starting with elementary in schools 
and secondary would start out with distance learning. And you can see that families were pretty concerned about that one. Um, staff as well. And the next is when we phase in by grade band. So maybe in this model, we're phasing in kindergarten and maybe sixth grade and ninth grade all at the same time, but they're all in different buildings. So this is where we're being very intentional about the grades that we're bringing in. And then depending on how that works, you can add more grades onto that. So phased in by grade bands was another option. And the third option is phased in by students with greatest needs first. And so that was students that may need um, additional support in schools, may not have tech access. Um, so that was um, the one that seemed to be the most preferred option when we looked at the phase in scheduling model. And when we asked just about overall comfort with returning to school. So what is people's overall comfort level? You can see there's a significant number um, of staff as well as families, 11% of staff and 14% of families that are not comfortable at all. And you'll see that number here in a, in a bit as well. Um, there's comfortable with concerns and um, comfortable with little to no concerns. And um, we asked this question very intentionally as well. Would you utilize a full-time distance learning option if it was provided? So as you can see, 290 of our families indicated that yes, they would want and prefer a full-time distance learning option in the fall. 66% um, said, no, mm -mm, we don't want that. And then there is 16%, 251 um, respondents that said possibly, maybe, or other. So when you look at the comments regarding other, Typically, that was, I would like to see what the requirements are in the fall. They think that there's significant, there's still a large span of time that those requirements could change, such as face coverings. So they would like to see what that could end up looking like in September versus June when they filled this out. Another is that they wanted to see what the full time distance learning option was before they were ready to commit one way or the other. So more information was what the people that marked other, that's what they were seeking. And as we are looking at, okay, full-time distance learning options, we sorted all of that information as well by um, grade spans. So you can see elementary, um, secondary, as well as Ferndale High School. Those are the um, grade levels and the approximate number of individuals that indicated that they would be interested in considering a full-time distance learning um, model as we move forward. So this is really helpful for us in, in our planning process. And here's another significant thing that we need to, and that we're really spending quite a bit of time talking about, is would you homeschool or withdraw your student if we did not offer a full-time distance learning option? And as you can see, approximately 38% of respondents indicated yes or other, which once again was, depends on what it looks like. So there are quite a few individuals here that have indicated that if we do not provide that um, full-time distance learning model or option in the fall, in addition to whatever else we do, they may pull their kiddos and take them somewhere else. So we just wanna be really um, intentional in thinking about that as we move forward with our planning efforts. All right. So now what I'm going to do is hand it back to Rebecca. And Rebecca is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the themes. And what I want to share is we had over 960 comments in our survey. And we had a great question. Somebody, someone asked us, are you going to share those comments? And we spent quite a bit of time talking about this, but ultimately we decided no, we weren't. And the reason why is because we specifically asked for um, identification. We asked for students' names. We asked their last names. And in those comments, a lot of times um, parents were very honest and shared things for their specific child. And a lot of times even the kiddo's name in that paragraph or in that comment section. So we did not want to publish the exact comments because of that. 
but we did want to try to identify themes from those comments that we could share. So Rebecca is going to share with you what were those themes that we saw emerge from those 960 comments we received on that survey. All right, thanks Kelly. So yeah, there was a number of themes that came out and we're, we were actually pleasantly surprised that they align really closely with the, the guidelines from OSPI on things that we need to consider when we're planning for our reopening. One of the big concerns that came up and was around childcare. A lot of our families that um, parents and, and caregivers work outside of the home thinking about um, if we do need to close down schools again like we did in the spring, or if we have a rotating schedule, um, what does that do to child care? And with the limited access to child care in our communities, that's a, that's a big concern for a lot of our families. And so there was just, um, I just grabbed one of the quotes that we made sure that there wasn't any identifiable information and student names, that type of thing, that kind of captured um, one of the, you know, some of the concerns from our, our comments. Um, from parents and, and balancing their need to work and continue and continue providing support for their students, um, both for the instruction and supervision. The next was around masks and social distancing. Um, I would say we had a lot of mixed comments on that. There were some that are very concerned about students wearing masks all day and staff wearing masks all day. And then there were some that um, were definitely um, concerned about students that wouldn't be wearing masks. They wouldn't want to send their student to school if there were kids and, and adults not wearing masks. So I think this is one of the quotes that is really just more curious, wanting to know what does that really look like? So making sure that we're clear about what does that look like in our reopening plan when we get to that final recommendation on what will be the expectation and if there are um, variances for specific individuals, what, what do those look like and what's the procedure for that? Um, health and safety was a, another big topic um, and again the, there was a lot of we're not quite sure yet things are changing quickly I, I'm, I don't know what to believe I don't know what to trust um, you know wh what guidelines are we going to follow and so that was another big concern and topic of, of responses that we got was around the health and safety of course because this is the situation that we're in another trend was um, transportation concerns about being on the bus, how we'll um, manage the buses, and then also if we're on partial days or rotating schedules, really what does transportation look like? And that will be a big challenge as we move forward and um, plan for what school reopening does look like and making sure that we're taking into consideration the, the safety of our students and, um, and access to instruction for our students as well for transportation. Kelly, can you move to the next one? Thank you. Another big trend that came up was equity of access. And that means different things for different people. But this quote, um, I think really helped us understand that there's a lot of our families out there that understand that some students are going to need more in-person access and some students will be a fine in a more remote um, distance learning platform. And so taking consideration all the needs of all of our students and creating a system that provides options um, that best meet the needs of individuals is going to be an important part of our, our work moving forward. And of course, lots and lots of questions and, and ideas and recommendations on scheduling and distance learning. Um, I would say this was probably where some of the more passionate responses were um, included. And so I think we need to just make sure that we're considering um, a wide variety of perspectives. And um, as we're making these schedules and plans for distance learning, I think um, Kelly gave us some good data from the survey that helped us understand that there's a lot of mixed ideas around that and we need to be intentional about making sure that we fully plan for all three options. Uh, lots of concerns around the social emotional aspect of, of distance learning and the, what the closure had done for our kids. And I too have my own children at home and it's been a, you know, it's a challenge on how we're supporting the um, emotional and social development of our students when they're isolated from their peers. 
and, and family members even. And so how do we plan for understanding the needs of our students as they come back into the school setting or into a distance learning environment and provide ongoing support to families and students um, to help mitigate the impact of the social, social isolation that's happened due to the um, closure. All right, and then access, and that this was around some of the high-speed internet and technology. Sometimes, um, some of the questions we ask is, do you have access to high-speed internet? Because that's one of the um, barriers. But another one of the barriers, I think this, this quote captures it quite well. We learned about this um, from a lot of our families, is yes, they have access to a, a computer or a laptop or um, a tablet, and they have internet, but they are also working from home, and then they have student, their own students working from home, and um, you know they have Zoom meetings for work, and their kindergartner has a Zoom meeting, and their high schooler has a Zoom meeting, and it's all at the same time. And so how do we balance the needs of uh, families working from home and students that may need to work from home and, and provide for those needs to make sure that everybody has access to their instruction and the resources to make that happen? And then there was a number of questions that came up from family members and, I, and um, how are we going to prepare our teachers to make sure that we can handle all the various approaches to instruction that will need to happen. And this is also professional development around the safety guidelines that are coming out from the health department. And so those were the big themes and some of the quotes that we pulled just to um, help paint the picture of, of what the what families are, are thinking and concerned about. All right, Kelly. Thanks, Rebecca. So now we are going to give you some time to process, but first I'm going to kind of talk you through something. So as we move forward with this group, as I mentioned, we are going to need to do quite a bit of work in sub such as um, you know, operations, um, going to do some work. health and nursing is going to need to do some work in terms of planning. But what we want to make sure we're doing is maximizing the time our subgroups have together and provide them a clear idea or plan um, regarding what does reopening look like? What is our recommendation? Um, because when we look at the survey results, each one of the um, concepts, scheduling concepts, um, is what they call it through the OSPI guidance, had a model or a concept that was more preferred um, by our community and staff most oftentimes. So we are in this place where we've received feedback from our um, community, our families, as well as our staff. And we're wondering, are we ready to go ahead and move forward and say, in the fall, this is what we are going to do. And so I'm just going to go over the slide and then I'll also give you a little more clarification. Um, so our initial interpretation of the data and the recommendations and based on OSPI guidance um, and the survey results, we need to plan for the following um, reopening scheduling concepts. So part of the guidance to be very clear, does not require that we provide full-time distance learning. That is not included in the guidance, but they want us to make sure, as you see over here, that we have that continuous learning option available, right? If we have to move to a full-time um, at-home model. But when we look at our survey results, here in Ferndale, there are a significant number of families that have indicated that they want a full-time distance learning um, option for their families. And if they don't have that option available, they will probably take their families elsewhere. Remember, there was a significant number that said yes, and then there was a significant number that said maybe, I think totaling 38%. So uh, we, this is just our initial recommendations, um, but we are going to ask that you are going to process this breakout group here in a minute, is Okay, so should we plan at this point to move forward with a, um, a couple different options here? And really all of these options could be working at the same time. So one of those is that all students could have the opportunity to um, opt in to a full-time distance learning model in the fall. So it's not a requirement, but it is an option that parents could intentionally um, access. So that's our wondering based on the survey results. Okay. Not a requirement, but a wondering. 
are looking at that. Okay, so should we move forward with that? The second item that we need to plan for is a phased in model. So what we're thinking right now is, okay, we'll have the 100% distance learning model functioning potentially based on this feedback here from this team as well as community. So the second piece would be there would be a hybrid model working at the same time. And that hybrid model is what people, um, what OSPI refers to as the split or rotating schedules. So in addition to that full-time distance learning option that's functioning, there would be the split or rotating schedule option for a, a certain number of families. So that's the option of the AB, the alternating days or the AABB, so my kiddos might come Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday, depending. When we looked at those two scenarios, both families and staff indicated that they preferred the AABB model. They were comparable, both were, they were similar, but they both preferred the AABB model. And when we look at that um, as a split or rotating schedule, we believe that's probably really helpful in terms of addressing health needs, um, cleaning needs, hygiene requirements, and controlling the spread of virus, um, the AABB, if we're going to have a group of kiddos in school um, during that time. So that's the other option we're suggest or not suggesting, we're asking for your feedback on, in addition to the phased in model. So once again, we can have a population of students that are 100% distance learning. We can have some that are working in a hybrid model. And then we can also have a group of students that are in the phased in model where we are identifying a group of kiddos. And once again, if we are looking at the survey results both staff and families indicated that they liked the phased in model that supported students furthest away from those educational or furthest away from educational injustice. So if we're looking at the survey results from staff and families, it seems like we have um, identified what those three models would be to plan for in the fall. So what we would like you to do, I'm going to turn it back to Rebecca. She's going to tell you how we are going to structure this. But really what we're asking is, are we at a point where we can say, okay, here are those different tracks or options that students will may have the ability to access in the fall. And then our subgroups are going to work on all the technicalities regarding each one of those plans. So for instance, I'm um, Luann. Luann, you happen to be in my sixth person thing here, in my menu that I can see. Luann can then be working with her subgroup in transportation. Are okay, so if I have some groups that are coming in a split option and some that may be in this full-time option, how can I make that work? How can we structure those routes? So we just want to be as um, intentional as we move forward with our planning. And our wonder is, are we at a place where we can comfortably make a recommendation on the models that we, the scheduling concepts um, per OSPI guidance that we move forward with. So Rebecca. All right, Kelly, if you go ahead and move to the next slide. slide. Okay, so Kelly already went over some of these pieces around um, what we're gonna be doing in our breakout rooms. I've already created the breakout rooms. I'm gonna open those in just a moment. When we set, go into the breakout rooms, you're gonna have 10 minutes um, to uh, introduce yourselves to the folks in your Group. Each group is five or six folks, so you should have plenty of time to introduce yourselves and talk about um, these prompts here. What are we missing as we consider these scheduling options? So the um, kind of the phased in approach um, in, in the building, the rotating schedule and the distance learning, the full-time distance learning. And then what, is, what additional factors should we consider as we are selecting a schedule that we may need to take into consideration? And then, um, we're going to also then, towards the end of this, as you're coming back into the group, we're gonna ask you to have somebody that can represent your group and provide some feedback um, to the, the large group around what, what came up during your breakout and what are some things that we need to consider. We're recording this and so we're gonna harvest that information and make sure that we're getting all the perspectives um, documented. 
At the end of this, we will also then be putting into the chat box a link to this poll everywhere. And that will be an opportunity for you to give specific feedback that you would like to have shared. And we'll be sharing that information as well to the larger group. And it is anonymous. And so um, that will be at the end. So a link will be put into the chat box towards the end of the breakout rooms. So if you're all ready, I'm going to open up the rooms and get you assigned and um, we're going to have 10 minutes and you'll get a warning at about 60 seconds before the breakout rooms um, stop and you get put back into the larger group. Probably not since none of them have left. How many groups were there, Rebecca? Um, there were eight. Okay. Eight groups with five or six in each. Rebecca, I'm just going to make a quick announcement about the chat. Um, before we go into the um, breakout, if that's okay. Yep. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. All right, I think everybody's back. So Fantastic, thank you. Away. So as we, um, before we move into um, sharing out just um, some thoughts or ideas from your breakout session, um, we did have a few people that were uh, arrived a little bit late. So what we did ask at the beginning of the meeting was, um, for you to complete an introduction in the chat. And in the introduction, we ask that you please include your name, please include your role, and your role being community member, teacher, student, um, as well as please um, share with us maybe your area of expertise or interest in participating on this task force. So just wanted to give you a friendly reminder if you haven't done so or already or weren't here earlier to please get that in the chat box before the end of the meeting. Thank you. And one other little caveat, we know that we appreciate that you're putting questions and thoughts into the chat. Um, we will gather those and respond, rather than trying to respond to them right now, um, respond to them ready for the next session. Excellent. So we've got some folks that are updating their, their name and their role and their areas of interest or expertise that they're contributing to this reopening task force. So um, our next step is to talk about what was discussed in your groups and what you'd like to share out. And so I'm going to ask that each of the breakout groups have somebody that can share out for um, just a couple of minutes some of the big ideas or, I, or questions that may have come up. Um, we have Pam Jenkins here who's taking some notes for us, but we're also recording so that we can um, gather that information to make sure that we're considering all the questions and perspectives. So who is going to uh, represent group one? Oh, the Daya's hand is up. Yeah, I, I can go. I don't know if we were group one or not, Rebecca. I was just in a, in a, in a chat, so. Okay. We, I don't we, know what we group have... number I was either. That's all right. I'll keep track. I'll be number one and go first. Is that okay? Sure. I'll All be right. number two and go second. Sounds All right. good. All right, so we, we, we had a lot of thoughts. Um, some of the things that really jumped out at us um, was, you know, there's some t discussion about the educational justice piece. If we're gonna decide what kiddos are gonna be back full-time and, um, you know, how, how do we define what that group of kiddos would be? Um, is that the students that are the, um, are they our, our special education learners who, you know, who have IEPs and who have, who have more needs that way? Uh, is it kids who don't have internet at home, and so they're you know they're not able to access any any forms of the online learning? Um, just thinking about how you know how we're going to work through that process and define um, that group, and then um, also um, we talked a little bit about the um, some some families may may want to to um, be that we might have to set up for some flexibility between the options, um, you know depending on how things go. Um, just anticipating that some families might try, you know, they might start down one path and then they, then they might change their mind as they talk to, you know, to, to other parents and other, other kiddos and they see how things are working. Uh, so just thinking about what capacity for flexibility are we going to have uh, for that? And then also um, some big questions on, on scope and sequence and how, how will everything work together um, so that um, if there is that, that full-time distance learning, how does that um, interface with, with the, the learning that's happening in the building? Um, and between uh, the kids that are just there for a couple days, and then also how do you how do you work um, the kiddos that are that are there all um, you know all week or four four days a week or whatever whatever it would be? How do those all link together? Uh, so those those were some of our biggest questions. All right, thank you, Obadiah. Heather. 
So um, our group spent the first couple minutes in amazement at uh, the work that you guys have done. So thank you for putting in all those work and the numbers and the data and the way it was broken down was very, very, very helpful and it was very user friendly. So thank you for the team of people that um, put that together for us. Um, there were two very similar things that Obadiah spoke about that we also spoke about. And one of the big things that we talked about was how do we, how do we make um, decisions for the programs within our building? So Vista, for example, or Cascadia or um, the developmental preschool, are we going to give programs options to maybe be an AB schedule or every other day schedule, or are these going to be building wide? Um, and then the discussion was around that was, um, is, is an A-B schedule enough for our high needs kids, um, particularly our life skills kids and our special education kids and our ELL kids who need more contact time? And, how, and then that led into our equity discussion. Um, and then how do we decide? How are we going to decide who are the most in need kids of being there every day or who gets priority into this model or this model or this model? And how does that all play into um, the decision making? Um, but it was really um, wondering whether or not an AB schedule is enough time for our kids that are um, in a life skills program. And then if they are every day, how do we, um, ensure that we have social distancing with kids that are very hands-on. All right, thank you very much, Heather. That, those are a lot of the questions um, that came up and that's part of the reason why I am on the team and that we have a number of um, families and students or, and staff representing our diverse um, student population to make sure that we are considering all those things as we um, plan and, and open up and that's one of the groups that's going to be breaking out. So thank you Heather very much for that Hi right. everybody. Uh, This is Sophia. I just got off work So I couldn't really contribute to my my breakout room discussion, but I was with Heather and I just had one question um, Would it be possible to do different types of reopening plans at different grade levels or is the district seeking to do one district-wide reopening plan? That was my question. Um, I, can, I, I can try to address that. I think the big idea is that we need to have multiple options available for families at each of the levels and taking into consideration the unique needs of individual students and, and groups of students. And so um, I think the big idea is that there will be um, options at each grade level. So for example, like a high school student may want to participate in person or their family may want to, them per, to participate in, in person to the greatest extent appropriate, or they may choose to be um, homeschooled or not homeschooled, but uh, do distance learning for the bulk or all of their classes that are appropriate. So I think there will be um, options and those are the things that we're considering and planning for. Sophia? Thank you. Sophia, I'd add to that. I think, I think there'll definitely be differences by grade levels. You know, having been a high school principal for a long time, there are things you can do at the high school, which is maybe even have kids not being supervised every second that couldn't happen at the elementary. So there are some, there's a little more flexibility for how we structure things at the, is at the high school. And there's also a lot more complexity because, um, I have not been fi able to figure out how you can split a class at the high school in half and then by second period they'd all still be in halves and third period they'd all still be in halves. So I, I anticipate we'll have a high school plan, a middle level plan, and an elementary plan. Does that make sense? Yes, that is very clear. Thank you. All right, another group that wants to volunteer or I can give some names for the next breakout group. Um, I can volunteer. This is Patrice. I had my hand raised. Okay. No one else wants to go yet. Yeah, there's multiple. Uh, so our group was mostly track. made up of, uh, we had two. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we had mostly parents in our group. We had two uh, school district employees, but our concern was we really felt like we had a lot more questions that we would want to have answered before we could fully 
kind of commit to one of the three options, but we were kind of leaning towards uh, potentially doing some type of hybrid option, but you know, we'd, we'd want to make sure that the responsibility of, of if we did 100% distance learning, if we offered that as an option, that that wouldn't put you know, a lot of additional pressure onto teachers that are also now having to deal with um, you know, trying to figure out the schedule or, you know, whatever. So we, we would want to kind of take a look and see what that would look like, whether it would be packets or technology based. Um, so that was one of our concerns, but the kind of overall leaning, I think, as if my group would agree, is that we were looking at some element of a hybrid option where we would really just kind of want to, to get a schedule out so that we could start planning, obviously, as, as best we could. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and is there another group and go ahead and jump in there because I I'll go. Okay, Melissa. Okay. Great. Thank so you. Um, we talked about the educational justice. Um, and then the other thing we talked about is if we were doing A B schedules or A A B B schedules, um, we're assuming that students will be working on the off days. And we were wondering what the responsibility of teachers for supporting students on the off days since they would also have students in their class. Um, and then the other thing we were thinking about is if we were doing the AABB schedule, um, could families choose days? Because families may have high schoolers and younger students that maybe they would need the high schoolers to help with childcare. So. Excellent. Yeah, and Melissa, th thanks for that group as well, because that did come up as one of the themes around childcare and scheduling, because there are older students that um, that take after and look after their younger siblings on non-school days. And so taking that into consideration on scheduling options for sure. So I'll go next if that's okay. Um, in our group, it seemed clear and you guys jump in that everybody was hoping for that model where remote learning is there and present at all times and then either the AABB model. That was kind of the way it came out. And one of the comments about the AAB mo AABB model is it was, the, it was felt by the parents in the group that that might be an easier schedule for parents to deal with is the two days on and then the rest. But the question did come up then, how do we support, just like Melissa was talking about, how does staff support students who are um, what what are they doing when they're off? What's that look like and how do we support their learning? All right, great questions and thank you for the contributions for the, from, I think that was group four, thank you. Tammy, you unmuted yourself, are you? Yeah, to, to piggyback on what Lori was talking about, we had several wonderings too. We could um, see us jumping into the AABB model and having the distance option. My big wondering is, um, in the survey data, was it evenly dispersed across school communities? Because um, I'm assuming the people who responded probably had access to technology. And I'm wondering if um, what that will look like for um, one school, if a large segment of the population chooses to do distance learning only and only some do AABB, as opposed to another school where everyone's doing AABB. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And what I can tell you is that um, we understand that a lot of the people that did respond do have access to ready access to technology. And so we have talked to some individuals on how are we going to gather more information as we fine tune our plan and our recommendation, because we do recognize there could be um, regions in our district and populations that we haven't been able to get their input and their feedback yet. And so how do, we, how do we push a little bit harder ourselves and look at where, what are ways we can reach out and get that input? And I would just like to add, Rebecca, if that's possible, that's a great question. Um, and so I'm just gonna share my screen briefly. Hopefully you guys see a graph right here. Do you see a graph? Yeah, okay. Um, so here is the distribution um, by um, grade in which the student will attend next year. So here is what you will see, which so we had a pretty decent distri distribution of participants on this. And if you come down here um, a little bit further, it asks what, um, what school they will attend next year. So here is where we can see um, the schools that were rep represented. Um, if you look at the elementary level, Cascadia had a 
146, Central 145, Custer 139, Eagle Ridge 161, Highland 168. So um, high school looks like was pretty well represented as well, but obviously, you know, they have more and more kiddos. So um, I'm sharing this directly from the survey because once again, this is the confidential information that I'm showing, but it does show the distribution of um, respondents for this. Yeah, so when you look at that data, it's actually a pretty good uh, percentage representation from each building. Um, Beach and the preschool had lower numbers and the high school had higher numbers, but that was also representative of their total student population. So that was good. Thanks, Kelly, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm looking for somebody um, that Rav, Linda, Kim, Ron, or Sarah, that group. I didn't have much time to dive in. I um, joined the great the break room a little bit later, but um, we had a teacher, and one of the parents asked the question: How are our teachers going to be able to accommodate all three different styles? You know, can our teachers be able to teach in the classroom for the students that are present, and then have our students that are also online inclusively? So those were some of the concerns that came up. Were there other con um, ideas or concerns that from that particular group? And we can take a minute and address that one because there we have had lots of discussions about what what is possible. Um, but we also think that there will be a, a smaller breakout group that will um, make recommendations on specifics on how those different models will work. It was brought up too in our group um, in regards to, um, and I'm not going to be able to speak as eloquently as um, one of our other team members put it, but um, looking at the percentage of, student, of parents that wanted the distance learning model only, um, being able to really dive in and other team members, please um, fill in what I'm missing, but being able to really know what it was about um, was it the face mask? Was it the inability to be able to dis be able to socially distance? Like, what was it about um, returning to in-person school that they were really um, uncomfortable about in wanting to do the distance learning? Does that sum that up, team? <laughs> Um, I think part of what we were talking about in terms of the survey was just that we felt like it did a good job asking the question in terms of folks who might want to homeschool because they're concerned about whether there's a distance learning option or not, um, but that maybe there might be a gap in our um, ability to gather information from families we might be losing because they don't like some of the OSBI guidelines and just that we sort of have this kind of unknown group of parents that maybe the survey didn't um, provide their perspective that we might not just sort of know that there's some students might be lost from our classrooms because of that side of the question versus people who want the distance learning option. So that was just a thing we were wondering about not knowing how to know how many people that impacts. I was wondering as well about the distant learning. I, I mentioned the small group even though I joined late that um, I think the the desire to have a 100% distant learning component has always been there. So I'm wondering how many folks opted to select that because they wanted it anyway versus wanted it because I don't want to go back in the facility. Because I've, I've talked to students who many of them would have uh, liked to have learned from home or they communicated with me while this was happening that this was a great option for them. And even if things go back to normal, they would like to continue distance learning. So I don't know if it matters to tease out the who would want it anyway versus who wants because of fear. Um, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so lots of questions and I don't know, um, Kelly and Faye, do we wanna take some time right now to try to answer some of those? Cause I don't know if we have the complete answer for um, a lot of them. I can, I can address the question about, um, let me go back and see if I have it in my notes well enough. Um, like what would what would be considered we for distance learning versus in person learning and the demands on um, a classroom teacher and access to support for kids when they're at home. We've talked about how do we um, you know assign classrooms to kids 
based on what their preferences are for at home learning versus in person learning or what what is appropriate for that particular student. So we may have um, you know, it may be an idea is that we may have a teacher that is supporting an entire class of kids that are, are doing entirely remote learning. Or we have teachers that are teamed up that are supporting, doing in-person instruction and supporting students that are at home so that um, a teacher is not trying to teach a class and support a student on independent work at the exact same time because that would be a challenge that may not be able to be overcome. And so we've, you know, We've started brainstorming some ideas, but I think this group as a whole is going to have a lot more ideas as we um, dive into that more more fully and and plan that out. So the team, um, thank you, Rebecca, for that. Our intent was to see where we were moving forward and if we are ready to commit to kind of here are our three tracks moving forward. And what I'm hearing or what I feel like I'm hearing from this group is we still have some work to do. We have some more questions and we have some more um, information that we need to gather before we move forward um, confidently and communicate that. Um, is that correct? You want to spend some more time working and processing. I'm seeing nods um, before we're moving forward. We have some more questions that we need to get answered. We have some more information. I'm seeing the chat right now. It sounds like um, some of the comments from the survey may be really helpful to try to understand a little bit more about the community's feelings and concerns. So um, Shay and Rebecca, I hope you're okay. Let's pause on the poll right now because what I'm hearing is that we're not really comfortable, we're not ready to do that yet. And that's kind of what our, our wondering was, is where are we as a group and a committee moving forward? And your voice is really important to guiding us in those efforts. And what we're hearing is we need to spend some more time on that foundation. So we're gonna um, do some more of that work. So that may mean that at the end, when we're asking for subcommittee signups, there may be a subcommittee that needs to um, be created that's talking specifically about the scheduling concept for next year. Um, and that's, that's great. Um, so let's just move that direction. Is everybody okay with that? Just a yeah. nod or a thumbs up, it's something perfect. Okay. We still have so, one more group we haven't heard from. Do we oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, John, Kelsey, Peter, Renetta, uh, Renetta Shannon, or Zach? Um, I'll speak for our group. Um, one of the things that was posed in our group was if you're running a 50-50 model, um, is that still enough to cut down group sizes to make sure they're still socially distant within the classroom? Does the square footage allow for that to happen with each of the classrooms um, at, each, at each grade level or, or um, elementary, secondary, or high school level? Um, so that was one question that was brought up within our group. Um, and then the other topic of conversation was access to childcare. How does that look like from a before and after school model, especially at the elementary level? Um, and how does that reflect the current guidelines that suggest keeping kids in pods and not intermixing groups um, as the best recommendation? And what does that look like if you're doing it two days on, two days off, no school day in the middle? Um, those are often harder for families to fulfill on the no school days already. Um, so those were just some of the questions that we talked about. Excellent. Thank you. And just to remember that we are taking notes on this because we want to we want to capture all the questions and ideas so that we can um, bring those back to the, the work groups that get broken out and and be addressed as we're doing this more in depth planning in the subgroups. Thank you. Are there any, I have marked down all the groups represented. Is there anyone else um, or any group that didn't get to contribute their processing and their thoughts? All right, I don't see any hands up and I don't see any microphones being turned back on. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next. Kelly, you ready? Sure. So I'm going to show the PowerPoint again. And what you will see, hopefully, is something that says, what is thought exchange? Um, Rebecca, do you, is that correct? Is that what you see? Yep. Just want to make sure I'm showing the right screen. Yep, we're on the right. Um, so we asked everyone to please um, access the thought exchange. And thought exchange allows stakeholders to share some feedback um, and ideas. And it also gives you the opportunity to give us feedback based on others' um, thoughts or ideas. And it's completely confidential, but it gives us an idea about 
what are priorities. And as a community, Ferndale has used this tool in the past um, to gain um, just some, some feedback or thoughts or insights regarding things. So we wanted to start there and the really what we were hoping to do is what are the values that this team really wants to operate um, within? Like what are those core things that as we are making these decisions regarding schedules or um, some of these other really important um, ideas or, or thoughts, what do we want to base those off of? And Rebecca talked about that earlier, you know, those core values and beliefs. So we wanted to, as a team, say, okay, as the reopening task force, what are those things that we want to hold near and we want to make sure that our decisions are grounded in? So um, we had 22 people participate. And um, so not as many as we would like to see, but um, 30 thoughts were shared by those 22 participants and 200 11 ratings were made. So what I want to show you is just um, here are some, this is a word cloud that was created and the larger the word, the more often it was mentioned or commented on or um, rated highly. So you can see here are the words that were used um, quite frequently through the thought exchange that was shared. I'll just give you a minute to look at this. And once again, we'll have these all um, this resource online as well if you want to use our time looking at it later. And when we looked at reoccurring themes from this group, um, when you filled out the thought exchange um, for the values of this group, here are the reoccurring themes that came up. So once again, we said, what are the primary considerations and highest shared values that should guide us as we plan to reopen in Ferndale? So you can see um, the larger the square um, is typically the higher the rating received, um, making it of greater value. So social emotional learning was the highest rated item at 4.1. And you can see it goes on to flexibility, um, health and safety, equity, technology, um, high quality education, um, behavior, and child care. So when we looked at this group and what the values of this group represent and what should we continue to take into consideration as we move forward with the work of this team, that was the theme that emerged. These ideas, um, these values are what we need to make sure we're taking and continuing to take into consideration as we are guiding our work. Um, the th thought exchange currently is closed. We closed it at two o'clock this afternoon, so we'd have time to put this together and add it to our presentation. But um, what I would like to do is I'd like to open it back up for a little bit of time. Um, and you should have received a link to the thought exchange um, in the email, but I would like to get um, maybe a few more comments added because once again, we do have about 56 people that's, that are participating. So I'd like to open it back up and encourage people to take a few minutes and read over some of those um, thoughts and maybe add a few more so we can make sure that our values truly are representative of, the, of this group. So once again, we were hoping to identify the values of this group so we can use those to help facilitate and guide our um, our efforts with this reopening task force. So thank you um, for that feedback and we will continue to um, open that up and as well as use this to um, inform our decisions. So um, I'm going to hand it to Faye and we probably we're getting really close to the end of the agenda. So um, Faye, I'm gonna hand it to you. Yep. Thank, thank you for sticking with us. Like we said at the beginning, we apologize. We know we're giving you a lot of information right now. Um, hopefully that information will be really helpful as we um, come back next week and um, continue this work all with a shared and common um, framework and understanding so that we can um, operate as one, one group with the same level of understanding um, of what we're talking about. So one of our realizations is that all of us can't do all of the work. And the reason that every one of you has been invited to participate on this team is because you bring something unique and something special um, to the group and a different perspective than just a couple of us maybe would have. 
Um, so we are going to form um, subgroups based off of the information that you shared with us in the chat. So when you introduced yourself and, and kind of shared maybe your area of expertise or area of interest, um, we will try to create subgroups that um, tap into your individual strengths. Like I know we have some people in here who are really um, strong in technology. We have um, Zach from the Department of Health. Um, so to place you with your um, um, team members that have come from a similar um, framework. So you can kind of see through these. These also match um, very closely with the guidance from OSPI. And if you think back to the slide previously where we were looking at your shared values and considerations, you can see they really overlap and align as well. So we're on the right page. Um, so if you haven't shared um, either in your application that you filled out to participate in the task force or you haven't shared in the chat where you feel that you would be um, able to contribute the greatest um, on a subgroup, please do so um, in the chat right now so that we have a, a log of that. Um, and then when we come back next week, we'll break out into our um, subgroups and start really digging in to some of that work. We'll ask um, over the next day or two, we'll be asking several people to lead and be the key facilitator for each subgroup so that you have that go-to person and um, within your subgroups, making sure that you have somebody that takes, is willing to take notes and kind of document your conversation because Pam is taking notes for us, but she can't be in eight places at, at one time. So um, just to make sure that you track kind of your discussions and questions and thoughts to share back out with the larger group. Um, so that's kind of our, part of our next steps and then our final next steps. Okay, so our final next steps, and this is our last slide of the night, is once again, as Faye mentioned, we'll be identifying subgroups based on your feedback. So that's why we asked you once again, areas of interest, expertise. Um, we will be selecting facilitators that will help us with the work of those subgroups. And um, we, as kind of myself and Faye and Rebecca, will meet with those facilitators and we will be asking and doing some planning with them in preparation for upcoming meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll also be doing some other steps in terms of um, this, there'll be a school board meeting next week that will give updates to them regarding our first meeting. Um, and there are just some other things that we'll continue to work on in preparation for our work. But, I want to really thank you for your time, your willingness to support this work. Once again, today, the whole intent and focus was to lay some foundational um, shared understandings regarding um, our, our goals with this process and um, some of the information such as the um, guidance from OSPI or the staff and family survey results um, that we will use when we are moving forward with our efforts. So we would like to thank you very much um, for being here, for representing our community and um, we look forward to the product that we will produce. And um, so thank you for everything. Um, any other final comments, Linda? Do you have anything you want to add? Before we... Rebecca? Yeah, no, no, I just want to say thank you. Yep. Yep. All right. Before we say goodbye to folks, um, Kelly, if you could reshare your screen and put the, um, the, the focus areas or the work group areas back up so that people can respond in the chat with which areas they would like to be considered or be interested in working on. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting some people um, that have put that in there, but if we could get more input, um, we would like to get people working in the work groups that make the most sense and that you feel the most um, appropriate for contributing to and you have some, some interest in. So if you can take a minute and let us know what your top couple are, that would be fantastic. And, and again, I think, go ahead and say, I'm sorry. I was going to say, again, we'll capture the questions that you've asked and get you um, 
answers to those questions that are informed and with the appropriate data so that you're as informed as you possibly can be as we go through with this work. So thanks, I'm seeing lots of comments coming in um, about where you feel like you could support the best. I really, really appreciate um, your insight. And Faye, I think we also discussed a little bit earlier is um, another um, subgroup that we may need to have functioning right now is um, regarding the scheduling concepts Correct. and how we want to recommend that moving forward. So um, it's not listed there because we didn't know if it would need to be, but it's not listed. So if you are interested in continuing to explore the scheduling concepts, um, and that was kind of the phased in model, split or rotating, um, those, those options, if you could please also indicate that, that would be fantastic. All right, so we will leave this. You're welcome to go ahead and, um, and leave whenever you're ready. I thank you again for being here. And if you're still finalizing your chat, you're welcome to stay on and um, go ahead and get that done. But otherwise, thank you for your time this evening. And we will look forward to seeing you um, next week at the same time. And you'll receive another meeting invite um, for that meeting. So yeah. thank you. And once again, if you have time, um, please go ahead and um, participate in the thought exchange and the link was sent to the initial email you received yesterday and we'll work within the next little bit to get that active again. So and we'll we'll send the um, Zoom invite out early next Tuesday morning. So you'll have it in plenty of time for the afternoon.